You're on, Baz. Sorry about that. Hang on a second. No audio. Ah, buddy. Oh. Okay, now you have audio. Nope, still no. You can hear me, but nothing else. Okay, now go. Good evening, everybody. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Baz, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to WWDC Cocoa Heads. Uh, we're online for the second year, just like WWDC. Before we begin, in the spirit of reconciliation, Melbourne Cocoa Heads acknowledges the traditional custodians of the countries throughout Australia and their connection to land, sea, and community. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Ooh, dollar, our, code of conduct, our code of conduct describes uh, how we respond to people being harassed or if you notice someone's uncomfortable or if you have any other concerns, please get in touch uh, in person, by email or we have an anonymous form online and you can see the full code of conduct and ways to get in contact on the website. Tonight we've got four great talks lined up. Uh, my thanks to the speakers for putting these together at pretty short notice this week. Uh, after the talks, we'll get together and we'll discuss them uh, with optional beers uh, in Zoom. And a link will be posted later on Slack for that. Uh, so first of all, we're going to have Jared, uh, who will run us through this year at WWDC. Uh, Ed is going to talk to us about a swift journey. Gio is going to go through what's new in testing. 
uh, and Rob is going to talk about Combine and uh, async and await. Uh, obviously, some of our in-person rules don't apply tonight. Um, so basically, if you have a question, ask it in the uh, hash meetup channel on Slack. Um, we can't really do interactive questions with uh, the presenters um, given the given the online presentation. None of this would be possible without our sponsors. Our gold sponsor is Itty Bitty Apps, and our silver sponsors are REA Group, Latitude Financial, and Cognizant. The next event that we were, uh, will be having will be the drinks night, uh, which should be on the 29th of June, uh, either at Penny Blue uh, or maybe online. Um, we will presumably find that out, you know, a couple of nights before. There are some other groups uh, that we like to keep everyone abreast of. Uh, Sydney Cocoa Heads um, usually have an event the week after us, so I assume they'll have one next week. Uh, GDG Melbourne uh, is always good to check in on for some Android news. And the Melbourne Web Dev Meetup uh, is also very good, so check them out on the links that you can see on the screen now. And if you need to find us, you can find us uh, at melbournecocoheads.com uh, or on the Slack uh, or on Twitter at Melbourne Cocoa. Some good Slack groups to check out. The Hash Meetup uh, Slack channel is where we chat about the, the current meal that's ongoing. Uh, there's a volunteers channel if you want to get uh, involved in helping us organize or run Cocoa Heads. Uh, there's a jobs channel if you need a job uh, or if you want to recruit people. Uh, and the speakers channel is where you can suggest uh, topics that you would like to hear about or suggest topics that you would like to speak about. Uh, we have mentoring available for people who want to speak for the first time. And there's no set format to talks. Five minutes, 10 minutes, 45 minutes, whatever whatever suits you, um, people will be interested to hear about it. Uh, apps that were shipped this month. Uh, and if you shipped any apps, please tell people about it in Slack as well. So a new version of Reveal is out, um, which has an amazing up-to-date design, actually, that looks fantastic. Uh, I think Carlos did most of that, I think. Um, and the new icon is really lovely. Uh, speaking about great design, the guys at Up Bank um, shipped a new feature called Two Up, which is uh, essentially a joint account. Um, I have one with my wife, it's really good. Um, but the most impressive thing about it is the marketing website. Um, so go and have a look at that, it's really good. Um, and they also shipped um, extra watch complications for trackers and savers. And Jared and the guys at AirWallX uh, have been working on an update to the AirWallX app, which is entirely built in SwiftUI and has iOS 14 uh, as a base. Um, AirWallX, if you don't know, uh, is helps businesses operate without borders. It allows you to move money around the world. Yeah, you can hold funds in over 11 different currencies. Uh, and they're going to be doing virtual debit cards and employee cards and Apple Pay soon. So hopefully. Jared can tell us about that uh, over the next months when they release those features. So uh, on the talks, first up, we are going to hear what happened this year at WWDC. So over to Jared for that. Thanks, Baz. You're off. Uh, yes, go for it. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming along to Lockdown Cocoa Heads. I'm Jared, and I'm here to give you a high-level overview of the big things announced at WWDC, as well as throwing a cool few bits and pieces that I've gleaned over the last couple of days since the conference began. I'm sure many, many more things will be uncovered as the conference continues, and I recommend checking out some of the videos getting uploaded daily to get better insight into what Apple's releasing this year. And this year, to me, definitely feels like a snow leopard year in that it's one that's really focused on improving and refining rather than big evolutionary changes. 
Um, but I'm not sure we can really blame them after the, the year that we've all had. It's been pretty intense for, for most of us. But um, I actually think this is a good thing because by all reports, iOS 15 beta 1 in particular is a fairly solid release so far. Apple engineers appear to have had time to get uh, things into a solid shape this year. And uh, that's where I'm going to start today, iOS 15 and the biggest highlights of it. Well, actually, it's not just iOS 15. This year, more than ever, we have a bunch of features that cross-cut Apple's entire set of operating systems. And like many people over the last year, Apple... Hang on a sec. Sorry, Jared, we've lost audio. I lost video for some reason. Can you reshare your screen? Oh, no, never mind. I found out it's changed. Okay, cool. Oh, Please continue. Which... Yep. Okay. Hopefully you can all see my screen again. Uh, like many people over the last year, Apple's employees have obviously been spending a lot of time getting used to remote working, as well as using apps like Zoom to coordinate meetings. Well, this year, Apple's decided to beef up FaceTime to include a lot of improvements. The first of which is FaceTime links. Now you can send a link to anyone to join a FaceTime call, which is pretty ideal for calendar invites. There's also portrait mode, which is maybe not quite as cool as snap camera filters, but at least you can get the nice uh, bokeh fil filter to blur out your background. There's also spatial audio, where individual voices now sound like they're coming from the direction in which the person is on the screen. And there's voice isolation, which this is really cool actually. Now if someone is vacuuming behind you, the noise from that will be filtered out entirely and you'll come right through clearly. But one of the bigger features that they're adding is SharePlay. Um, so now while you're on a FaceTime call, you can watch movies and TV shows together with friends with synced playback controls and automatic volume adjustment when people speak. But this also goes beyond video. You can share music currently through Apple Music. However, it's nice this year there's a FaceTime API. So I suspect other services like Spotify will use We'll also offer integration soon. So it's great to see Apple open up some of this stuff, considering they did make a promise a long, long, long time ago that FaceTime would be open sourced. Not quite there yet, but at least we're getting something. <laughs> um, surprisingly, Apple's also added screen sharing, which is perfect for showing your parents where the Wi-Fi setting is on their phone, which is something I have to do a lot. And this is really surprising. FaceTime comes to Android. Well, browsers anyway, not quite not quite native Android anyway. Uh, maybe an Apple arriving future, but for now, Android users are stuck with a website. Now, moving on, another big feature this year is focus and notification improvements. Now, do not disturb is a pretty great feature, but it is pretty heavy handed. Apple's now providing a way to bucket particular apps so they don't disturb you with push notifications while you're in a particular focus. So for example, you might only want to allow notifications from mail and Slack while you're at work and leave noisy chat groups from friends until the end of the day. Third party apps are also able to integrate with this feature and are able to break through a user's focus with important notifications if needed. Uh, this year, we also have more control over the importance of notifications or telling the system the importance of them. For example, those which are time sensitive and require a user's attention immediately. These are treated slightly differently by the system. Time sensitive notifications, for example, will stick around on a lock screen until a user acknowledges it. Thankfully, the critical alert, which plays a sound even when your phone is muted, requires an approved entitlement, so bad app citizens won't be able to blast the user with it. One of the really cool features I thought this year was actually in live text. Uh, there's always a bunch of fo um, photos improvements every year, but live text is by far the coolest, I think. It's basically OCR. It's able to look for written text in photos and allow you to pull out, pull it out and perform actions on it from copy and, copy and paste to calling phone numbers. Also available is a translate feature, which is pretty impressive and definitely something that could be useful if the vaccine rollout ever finishes and we're able to go on holiday again. This works on not just text, but even works on objects. So basically, we finally have hot dog, not hot dog in iOS that actually works. Uh, as has been the case in recent years, Apple continue to make a big push about user privacy, 
A few weeks ago, Apple finally added app tracking transparency that requires developers to ask, to ask for access to the user's advertising identifier, which greatly upset Mark Zuckerberg because it makes it harder for Facebook to track users across apps. And you can see why. These are some metrics from Flurry, which shows only 4% of users allowed sneaky apps to track users across, across their apps. Um, I had expected Apple to poke Facebook a little bit more with iOS 15, but they got off relatively lightly this time around. Well, almost. Uh, there was a little addition to the app review guidelines, which says that any app that supports account creation must also support account deletion. Most, uh, but actually the Apple critic who's likely most upset with iOS 15 right now is a guy called DHH, or his initials anyway, the co-founder of Basecamp and Ruby on Rails. Um, and he's upset, well, likely to be upset because uh, he runs a, a new app called Hey, which is a privacy-focused email service that aims to prevent user tracking and data mining. Apple clearly had a good look at his app, maybe because they saw it from all the tweets he was sending them, and have made some big updates to mail this year. Basically, Mail will do a lot of the same stuff that Hey does, blocking tracking cookies and your location. So pretty good stuff. Um, I personally haven't used Mail for a number of years, and I think this will definitely get me to switch back. Uh, another really cool feature is uh, Privacy Report, which lets us view how often apps access permissions like location and camera. Something really fascinating is the ability to see which URL endpoints an app hits. Now it'll be really easy to see which apps are bad privacy citizens who send data to lots of analytics companies. There's also iCloud Plus, a new paid service. You're now able to create essentially disposable email addresses for signing up to websites with, which will forward to your real email address. There's also iCloud Relay, which is basically Apple's own VPN to hide where you go on the web. Uh, this will be added to existing iCloud plans at no additional cost, which is nice. Uh, Series also had a bunch of improvements, and uh, we now finally have on-device speech recognition. Uh, Siri can perform many tasks without going on the internet, and this makes signi uh, Siri significantly faster, and this benefit was shown by making the Translate app super speedy. Um, and I'm kind of surprised this one took so long, but Siri is now being opened up to third-party apps on HomePod, which is great for users who have apps that aren't made by Apple, which I imagine will be just about everyone. Uh, maybe Spotify will finally get full Siri access on HomePod. That would be nice. I mean, I don't actually own a HomePod, but I imagine people who have one would want that. But one of the best bits of iOS 15 is that it runs on all the same devices that support 14, which coincidentally are the same devices that run 13. It's great news as we want our users to upgrade. We don't need to support older operating system versions longer than we need to. So all of these improvements mentioned are also unsurprisingly coming to iPad, but the iPad is getting a few specific features of its own. Now you can go straight into split view from the app switcher by dragging an app over another. There's also a really cool feature where you can write a quick note by dragging an Apple Pencil from the corner of your screen without having to switch to the Notes app. But many of the big ticket iPad items this year are some of the big ticket items from iPhone last year. So now we have widgets and the app library on iPad, just like the iPhone last year. The app library now lives in the dock and there's a new larger format for widgets, which I guess is cool. Um, Xcode for iPad, this is basically a meme now. Every year someone says Xcode for iPad's coming out. It's coming out this year. Now it kind of is almost. Well, it's actually a Swift Playgrounds update. And um, basically they're extending that app to let you do a lot of the same things that Xcode does. You can now uh, develop a full app and deploy it to the App Store straight from Swift Playgrounds. So now for the first time, your apps can get rejected by Apple directly from the iPad. This looks pretty cool and I expect will become much more fully featured as time goes by. Um, this does beg the question, uh, should the app be called Swift Playgrounds if it offers more than just Playgrounds? Perhaps not, but I'm not in Apple marketing. So this year, macOS is Monterey. 
It boasts many of the same features in iOS 15, like share play focus and the privacy features, but easily the coolest feature it does have is a feature called universal control. You can use a single keyboard and mouse or trackpad to control your Macs and iPads together. You can even drag and drop between them. It's unclear exactly which devices will support this or whether it'll be tied to the new M1 devices, but it's definitely a very cool feature. Shortcuts is also finally coming to Mac, one of those big ticket items from a few years ago, finally making it to Mac, um, which I guess makes sense, but it does make Automator look like the odd one out. Uh, Apple says it'll be a multi-year transition. Uh, I suspect that means it'll be like dashboard and that'll be around for years after people finally stop using it. You can import what Automator workflows into shortcuts. I personally love Automator, but I suppose this one was really only a matter of time. Now, unfortunately, I just saw this morning that um, a lot of these really cool uh, features in Monterey are actually limited to the new M1 Max, very annoyingly. Um, you, they won't work on Intel, you'll have to upgrade. This is because the new devices have the neural engine, which is allegedly used for some of these complex tasks didn't know some of these complex tasks included throwing a, showing a 3D globe of the earth, but anyway, that's that's up to an Apple engineer, I suppose. Unfortunately, this also includes uh, portrait mode in FaceTime, live text, and a few other bits and pieces. And finally, one that's probably very interesting to a lot of developers here, Buddy Build finally shows up in some form. Xcode Cloud is Apple's new continuous integration and delivery service that is entirely accessible from within Xcode. The aim is to make Xcode the central location. There's no need to use another Git client to push your work, no need to go to another website to create a pull request or leave Xcode to deploy. It's all within Xcode. It does what you'd expect in a CI CD system, push your code to a repo, run tests on it in parallel, which is a nice addition, and distribute it to testers. You can run workflows across multiple OS versions and Xcode releases. There's built-in integration with hosting providers like GitHub, as well as Slack for alerts. Um, at the moment, it looks pretty simple, but time will tell how much customization is available and whether it'll be worth our time to move. I'm definitely very interested to play with this one. Um, and as part of this, TestFlight is finally coming to the Mac many, many years late but it's now here or will be very shortly. Um, if you want to join the waitlist to get access to Xcode Cloud, that is available at the link now. It's free during the beta with pricing to be announced later this year. Hopefully it's decently priced. Uh, we shall see. Uh, another really interesting feature is it relates to AR. You might say, oh no, AR. Apple loves talking about AR. I wish they'd stop. I mean, it's cool, but I mean, many of us don't have much to do with it, um, but at least it's not the, the same tabletop demo that they often do. Uh, this feature is called Object Capture. Object Capture lets you take a series of 2D images using an object, or 2D images of an object using your iPhone or iPad and use the new Object Capture API to create a 3D object from them. Amazingly, you can create a 3D object from these images using this tiny, tiny, tiny amount of code. That's very cool. Um, I honestly think this is totally insane because I've attempted to use 3D modeling programs in the past and it is not easy. Um, I can definitely see a lot of applications for this technology, particularly things, you know, like Ikea furniture. That would be pretty cool to just be able to scan a chair and, you know, see it in your house. Um, so that's all for the consumer stuff. Let's talk about a few interesting developer-focused things that I've picked up. Um, the, the one that I'm very most excited about from this perspective is async await. And why this is exciting is it because it lets you delete a lot of boilerplate code. And the, the less code you have, the better, because that's where all the bugs are. Every iOS developer has likely written something like this before. It's callback hell. What's it doing? Causing a mess mostly. And what if you could get rid of this crap and write code in order, have it wait, but without blocking the thread you're on? 
that's essentially async await. It lets you write asynchronous code without all the boilerplate that's cleaner, shorter, and less likely to result in you forgetting to call a callback somewhere. And um, this also makes write tests for asynchronous code trivial, so an excuse for us to write more tests. There is one thing, however, that does suck about async await, and that's that it's not backwards compatible. So if you want it, you need to be running iOS 15. So basically, we can't use it for a year or two, most likely. Um, apparently, it's something that's really hard to backport. They are looking into doing it, but it's not looking too hopeful going by the post on, Swift floor, on, on the Swift forums that I read. Um, fingers crossed, with enough pressure, they might add it to a later beta, but at this stage, they're, we're out of luck. Now I just want to cover a few smaller highlights. And uh, the big one is Apple is now eating more of their own dog food. Apple have rewritten the weather app and it's got some really gorgeous weather effects. It's now entirely re entirely written in Swift UI, or allegedly anyway. Um, now Apple can experience all the bugs too and hopefully fix them for everyone. Uh, new in Swift UI this year, it's mostly a bunch of small additions, things that arguably maybe should have been there earlier, but at least they're here now. Uh, there's new modifiers to add in search bars, pull to refresh, and swipe actions on list rows. Also new is async image, which is great because that's one more third party library that you can all delete. And surprisingly, there's also markdown support in text objects as well as NS attributed string, which is pretty cool. I used to work with a guy who loved Markdown, so this would make him and all the other web devs really happy. Uh, Mac, Mac OS is also getting some love this year. Um, it's now got a table um, that you can create using Swift UI. And I just want to cover one last thing in UI Kit. I'm sure there are many, many other things, but this is a real standout for me because I've been waiting for it for a long time. And Apple's been teasing me with it in their Maps app. It's a partial sheet, and we only just wrote our own custom version of this, so it's only natural that Apple decided to add it this year. I'm not sure if there's a Swift UI modifier for it yet, but at least it's there in UI Kit, so with some bashing, we can we can get it in. And that's it. Apologies to the Apple Watch fans. It got cut from this talk. Um, you did get some new watch faces, though. Uh, I'm sure there's much more that Apple announced, but uh, I hope that gives you enough of an overview of some of the cool things announced at DubDub. Thanks. Oh, bloody hell. Well done, given that I had about 72 hours to do all of those slides. I was about 60 <laughs> slides, so well done. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, it was a crazy few hours there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next up, we've got uh, a swift journey. Uh, with yes, we can. Terrific. Um, so the last time I was here was uh, I gave a presentation in 2018 um, and when I first started the first slide for my career there was a burst of laughter from the audience because I was a dinosaur stuck back in 1970 level programming but 
I was 2014 when I first started trying to work with Swift. And I was kind of excited. The watch was coming, Swift was coming, and I thought it would all come together. Unfortunately, in 2015, after I'd been to WWDC and for the first time, a client rang me up and I then disappeared for two and a half years to um, program manage their delivery of their CRM. So I wasn't able to get down into the details of Swift. However, um, after that, I was able to move back into the development role and I started connecting with you guys and gave the presentation on where I'd been and where I was going. The good thing about that presentation was that it led me to being introduced to Nicole Rowland and um, she offered me a role with her in Swinburne to deliver creating data-driven mobile applications. So that's what I've been doing since uh, 2019. This is the third year and we have tutored and brought to the market, if you like, about 100 developers. Uh, Nicole and I gave this presentation similar to this last year at uh, DevWorld, and there you can see me with my COVID-19 beard. Um, what I'm doing now is taking the, the elements of that presentation and taking it through a bit of a journey of how we've been extending um, the curriculum. So the students we get are typically, we ask for them to have a strong, solid object-oriented programming background. Some of them tick the box, but clearly don't have it and then struggle through the first uh, third of the um, semester. And the other requirement which causes a lot of issues is the requirement for people to have Macs. And we have a real entry cost barrier to being able to put students through and get them up and going in the iOS uh, Swift UI kit world. Um, and we also get people who don't really, that you know, the completion of this unit is just a way of them getting a tick in a box and their main focus is on something like networking. Uh, the structure of the unit is phased over three, four week, mod sorry, three modules of four weeks. And the first four weeks are about the fundamental skills where we introduce them to GitHub, Swift, Xcode, iOS, and get them going with the fundamentals of the language and the fundamentals of building their first UI, basically a conversion application. The next four weeks are all about the data-driven focus of this particular unit, which is data here on the device, whether it's coming from a GPS sensor, accelerometers, gyroscopes, or whatever. Data there, which is data that's in the cloud. So we ask them to take an open API of their choice and integrate it into an app. And then data everywhere. That's kind of the credit task where they take the, an open API, they take the edit and addition of tables that they did in the first app and integrate that together and then push some information to a, um, a service such as Facebook or Twitter. So an example of that is somebody will write themselves a restaurants in Melbourne app. They'll go to their favorite restaurants using MapKit. And when they're there, maybe take a photograph of the menu and press tweet and have their review of the restaurant go live. So that kind of brings everybody up to a reasonable level of capability by the end of eight weeks. And then we try to get them to work with the community. So I push all the way through each of the semesters, come to Cocoa Heads, get involved, become part of the community. I'm constantly asked, you know, how can I be get a job in this industry? And I'll say, come to Cocoa Heads. And I really would like to commend to the people in the audience who are hiring people that if you come across any of our students who have done the distinction and high distinction stretch, where they've moved from a vanilla, you know, Swinburne student on the left of the screen to a production ready engineer on the right, they are of good capability and good quality. 
the distinction stretch, we ask them to come up with a concept, pitch it to us, come up with the design, pitch that to us, show us a bit of a prototype, and then do a build intensive integrate and test phase. Um, and that's what they, about four students, five students have been doing for the past couple of weeks. And they'll be presenting to myself and uh, the lecturer in charge tomorrow and doing their final demonstrations for getting distinction or high distinction. Now, alongside with this, because this unit only goes in the first semester of the year, I picked up a second unit, which is unit user-centered design. So I want to spend a little bit of time on that and talk about its relevance with respect to um, SWIFT. So user-centered design takes a, an ISO framework and an ISO methodology and identified work products within the ISO world. And we give, create miniature project teams of three to four students, give them a project brief, and we ask them to come up with a design. So they go through the whole process of who are the users, what are their needs, what are their wants, what are their desires, how can we try to meet those, and iterate through the design process of a wireframe, low fidelity, medium fidelity, and high fidelity prototypes. We get them to use, we're quite happy if they use PowerPoint and Keynote with hotspots, or they can use Balsamic, which is a desktop computer system that we have in Swinburne Laboratories, or tools like X, uh, Adobe XD or Sketch or Figma. It had always been my ambition that we could introduce them to storyboarding and be able to produce a high fidelity prototype with some storyboarding and minimal amount of code, but we've not been able to pull that off. Certainly what we do get is students that go through the user-centered design course, UCD, and then end up in CDDM and vice versa. So again, if you have somebody coming to you and says, yes, they did user-centered design at Swinburne and or CDDM at Swinburne, then I really do commend them to you. The most fascinating thing to me about user-centered design is they go through the design process, but we then stress test the design by putting them into our usability lab, which of course in the COVID world has been a little bit difficult, but we've done it basically through tools like Skype for Business and Zoom and so on. But it's astonishing when they think they have a great design, they develop five test tasks to 10 test tasks for users to use, they bring in a naive user, the user has to perform the task and we film and uh, record their interactions and the screen interactions and then say to them now rate your design on the basis of real world tests and it's absolutely fascinating watching what they thought was intuitive and obvious just fall apart and it's a great experience for them. I've been working with the curriculum over the last year or so in trying to push it in two different directions. So broaden it from the fundamental skills, integration skills and consolidation with the community to looking at things like project management, risk management, test-driven development, RUP, unit, RUP um, approach to the world, performance testing, string, stress testing, and at the technical end of the spectrum, looking at functional programming and numerical computing, recursive programming and statistical computing. And I've been directing the students to the SWIFT uh, organization packages such as SWIFT Neuromerics, SWIFT algorithms and SWIFT collections, which allow you to extend the language in nice areas. Now the code on the left here is actually a Python uh, programming and I've had to learn Python now to sort of come to grips with how some computer science students and uh, problems are being solved. And there's a nice feature in um, Python called yield, where you can progressively push results out of your thread back to um, the main thread. I was kind of hoping that over the next couple of days, the last couple of days rather, I would have been able to um, solve the problem by using async and await or um, collaborative sequencing, but I haven't been able to pull it off yet. This is an example of some of the numerical computing pro challenges that I've been throwing at the students. And as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, there's a Swift playground where 
we've looked at the Euclid's uh, GCD theorem, and we've been able to demonstrate graphically how quickly that theorem does collapse from dealing with numbers in the hundreds of thousands to find what are the common denominator in a very quickly quick process. I like to portray some of these results in graphical ways. And uh, the one on the right there is an example of the program of uh, finding uh, XY coordinates and plotting, um, sorry, just to go back. It's an example of how to find uh, integer pairs that satisfy, satisfy the equation in the bottom of the screen. Anyway, the most recent one we've been doing is this um, GCD problem. And here's an example of the competition that I get from other um, professionals across the Twitter sphere of coming up with solutions, uh, whether it's a basic APL, Julia, Scala, C++, Perl, Bash, Lisp, Excel, whatever. Uh, so the challenges I'd like to set to my students is here's the problem. Here are what other people are coming up with solutions. Now let's devise a swift solution that is as neat as some of these solutions that you see on your screen in front of you. Whoops, sorry. There was one glitch. Um, so one more thing. The impact of dub dub. This is the week of dub dub. It's been a great dub dub. Not as I think it's you know a talk cycle of uh, improvements. As uh, you know, was stated earlier, very most eloquently. So Swift 2019 was really good. Brought us Swift UIs. I had a good look at trying to bring that into the semester for 2020. However, it became clear in early 2020 that Swift UI was moving too quickly and was going to obsolete our, our teaching materials. So we stepped away from it. 2021, we probably should have wrapped up and put in more Swift UI contact. However, you know, the, the pandemic was with a pandemic. However, a number of the students in the semester have tackled it in extensions to their modules and projects. Going forward, I'm going to be looking at how we can produce or introduce combine, async await and structured concurrency and continue and push our involvement in very swift packages such as numerics. Thanks very much. That's the evolution of my swift journey from uh, 2014 to now and how we try to take uh, some of our students along the same journey. Back to you. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. I mean, it, I always find it very easy after you've left university to kind of forget about university and it's, it's just a, a stage of your life and you never really think about it again. But every time I look at what happens uh, at universities these days, there's always really great stuff going on and a real desire to stay relevant and stay up to date with the technology, which is excellent. Thank uh, you very much. I appreciate it. And I appreciate the tweets uh, in detail. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ed. Uh, okay, next up, we have Gio, who's going to go through uh, some of what's new in testing, uh, and I think also some Vim as well. Over to you, Gio. Hello everyone, uh, this is Gio. Um, I'm a mobile infrastructure engineer at Automatic. You may not have heard of Automatic, but I'm pretty sure you've heard of some of our products like uh, WordPress.com, Tumblr, WooCommerce, SimpleNote, and other products. Just real quick, Automatic is hiring mobile developers, Android, iOS. If you're curious about working for a big distributed company that really cares about being inclusive and uh, having work-life balance, get in touch with me and I'll tell you more about it. 
So apart from working at Automatic, I am really into testing. I am test infected. And so this year I paid attention to all the news about testing that uh, were announced. Um, tonight, I want to talk to you about uh, X Xcode Cloud, how to test async await, the new XCT expect failure API, test repetition, and uh, the new add tier down block API. So Xcode Cloud, and uh, as Jared said earlier, <laughs> so that's what they bought Buddy Build for, right? Uh, what is Xcode Cloud about um, is Xcode's Apple's continuous integration solution that aims to bring uh, all of that into Xcode so you don't have to leave your IDE to learn and what your tests are doing if they passed, if not. Uh, there's more to it, and uh, which we'll see shortly. So here's a bunch of links and interesting uh, um, things about Excel Cloud, uh, link to the docs homepage, which is pretty e extensive about all the different features, although I didn't see a lot of how to set it up. Maybe it's because it's still in beta and we'll see more of that uh, as it rolls out properly. Uh, it supports GitHub, Bitbucket, GitLab in all the different configurations, so, so that, that's cool. It has environment variables, uh, which uh, I don't know, I wasn't expecting that, um, but it does. It uh, also has the sort of de facto standard CI environment variable, which uh, um, tools like Fastlane use to verify whether the automation is running in a continuous integration environment or not. It also have web. It also has web hooks, so you can, you know hook into the webhook and you can turn a light red in your office if the test didn't pass or put the information in a dashboard. For some reason, you can only configure five that's written in the, in the docs. Um, hopefully they'll give us more because once you get started with webhooks and lights and dashboards, you, you can never have enough of those. Now, what do you need to do to um, support ex integrating consume Xcode Cloud, make use of the services that Xcode Cloud offers. All the usual stuff, of course, you need to use Xcode with a project or a workspace, have a shared scheme uh, so that the, the CI environment can see your scheme and, and run it because if it's not on Git, it, it can't see it. Uh, you need to give it access to the, the dependencies. Um, so if you're using private repos, I assume there's going to be a way for you to let uh, Xcode Cloud fetch them from, from Git. And, and this is the interesting part for me is you need to use automatic code signing. So uh, this is pretty cool because basically we can offload all the code signing drama to Apple and uh, hopefully they know how to do it better than we do. And that is one less headache. Um, unless you are a big team and you want to ship your app uh, on uh, App Center as well, because maybe you want to have internal betas. Um, I'm a bit skeptical of just uh, turning on automatic code signing. Or rather, I can expect that if you want to use Excel Cloud and then have more automation on the side, you'll need to jump through some hoops to configure your own bespoke automation to survive alongside it. This year at DubDub, Apple is really, has really gone all in with pr developer productivity, not just for the, the individual developer, but for the team. They added features in Xcode that uh, really helped the, the whole team. They really want Xcode to be the, the home of software development for iOS, macOS, and, and whatever. And they, they don't want you to leave. So now you can, um, Xcode already had Git, support and integration, but now it has, um, it integrates with your uh, repository and uh, with your like uh, GitHub or Bitbucket, so you can check out a PR, merge it, you can do all that stuff from within Xcode, including um, doing code reviews from there. If you really like Xcode and you like to stay in, in there, I think this is, a, this is a nice feature. I do wonder how all those messages are going to look like uh, when they get posted uh, to GitHub. But um, yeah, soon, hopefully, we'll get access to the beta and we'll, we'll find out, right? But I have a question for you. 
would you trust Xcode to do all that work for you in the cloud? I, I'm a bit worried that Xcode cloud, that cloud is going to be like a, a storm cloud, you know? Xcode in the cloud, what could go wrong? Now, I, I'm not obviously joking. Apple has a lot of very smart people working on this, and uh, it seems like they're embracing a bit of iterative process. You know, they have the beta and all that kind of stuff. So maybe the version one is going to be a bit rough, but... Uh, I really have high hopes how this is going to shape up in the future. At the same time, though, I it does look like the kind of service that will be very good for the indie developer or the small team, like most of what Apple builds, and not really suited for, for, for big teams. Um, I don't know. Happy to be proven wrong. Only time we tell. Can't wait to get my hands on the beta. Now, moving on. Async await and unit testing. Writing and testing asynchronous code just got much, much easier. Jared did a great job at showing how async await, this new pattern built into the language, simplifies asynchronous code. It makes it linear. It gives you the illusion that is that is all linear. When it comes to testing, um, to show you how much it improves testing, I just want to show you how we used to do it before. So before we had to define an exit test expectation to say, I expect something to happen eventually. Then in the callback of the asynchronous code, you would inject uh, your own code to run your assertions and then fulfill the expectation and then tell to the, the test runner, hey, wait for the expectation. And that, that code really need linearly, like that is confusing because you, you read the wait for expectation after you call expectation fulfill, but obviously the expectation fulfill will happen after you call the wait for because of the code is asynchronous. And now with async await, this code becomes this, which is linear, straightforward, and beautiful. And what I really like is because the feature is part of the language, you don't need, there's no extra um, API that you need to to learn to use in in exit test. You just write a synchronous test for a synchronous code in the same way that you write a, a production code that uses a synchronous code, and uh, this is very neat. Now, XET expect failure, the best API you should never use, and I'll tell you why in a minute. So say that you have this test that, uh, this code rather, that doesn't do what it's supposed to, but you don't know how to fix it, you don't have the time to fix it. You might be trying to comment that code and forget about it, but now we have a better way to do it, which is to say to the uh, test runner, I expect this code to fail. And Xcode is gonna, um, exit test rather, is gonna mark it in, in a special way that uh, it failed, but it is grayed out. And uh, this is something funny, or it is appropriate, but I find it funny. If the test then somehow, if the code starts to behave properly and the test somehow passes, the expect failure fails. And I'm going to get confused a lot uh, over the next slide with the, the test succeeded but failed. You know, but it makes sense. The test uh, are telling you, hey, your mental representation of the system where this uh, code doesn't behave appropriately changed. So dang, test failure, here's a feedback for you to, to know what to do with the code. The, this API uh, has a not strict mode that you can that you can turn on by saying strict false. So if uh, you don't have a test that is, you don't have code that is a bit, just a bit flaky, then you can tell, hey, you know, I expect it to fail, but uh, if it doesn't fail, uh, don't worry about it. Um, happy days, I'll, I'll, I'll take it, you know, I'll, I'll take any test, green test that, that can come, which uh, may be handy for, for flaky test. More versatility in, in the API, you can drill down into the, the failure that you get. The failure is represented with an XCT issue object and it has a bunch of properties, and um, I'm, a, uh, I'm pretty sure that is the object that Exitest uses under the hood to report all the failures. And uh, 
So you can inspect it and uh, that closure, you can return true or false if the failure is what you expected. So if for some reason, see here in my example, I have something that should return 42, but is broken, so it returns 27. If then it starts returning 73, that is a different failure that I wasn't expecting and my test uh, tells me about, hey, um, failed because um, I, I, there you go, I told you I was gonna get, in, I was gonna get confused. I'm failing because I didn't get the failure that I was expecting, you know. Uh, speaking of um, closures that you can pass to the, to the function, the, it has this beautiful way to handle code that throws. So um, if um, instead of a test failure, you have code that, that throws, and you don't, like you expect it to throw in that, you know that it's broken, but uh, is not its behavior because if you want to test that code throws, you can use XCT uh, throws error, something like that. But if this is like the kind of like a, it shouldn't do it, but it does because it's broken, you can wrap it in um, in an XCT expect failure. And um, what's very cool about it is that uh, it rethrows. So if then like we go back to that example, the code is a bit flaky. If uh, we run into the the randomness scenario in which uh, the code uh, doesn't throw, its value passes out and uh, we can use it in the test. And um, I think this is pretty neat. Uh, um, took me a while to understand the type signature, but once I, I got it, like uh, I really appreciate it. I think the exit test uh, developers at Apple have done a great job. Now, I think you've gotten the theme as I was talking about this API that is useful for code that is broken, is useful for code that is flaky. It is a shortcut. It is a, a cheat code that you can insert in your test to bypass failures, all right? And uh, that can be useful if you are refactoring, if you're really running out of time and you just want to, you can't deal with broken tests, that the broken tests are blocking your build and you can't ship, but really, when you have a test failure, you need to deal with it as soon as you can. Otherwise, it's going to be harder and harder to fix it. Um, and I, I am worried that this API is going to allow developers to incur a lot of tech debt that uh, they're never going to pay in the future. So it's a great API, but be very careful when you use it. Moving on to test repetition, this is another tool that is useful for avoid dealing with or rather or, or rather address flaky test. So um, test repetition is a new mode that we a new configuration that we can enable in the, the test plan. So you should go to your test plan and then into the configuration tab and find a test repetition mode. There are four modes. The first one, the default one, is none, so the tests don't get repeated. Then there's repeat until failure, retry and failure, and up until maximum repetition. And let's see how, how they work. So I cooked up a test that fails randomly, and I run it a bunch of time to see uh, how it behaves. So with this one here, the until failure, the test is going to run until it fails. This is useful to discover flaky tests. You say, I, I imagine this is going to be particularly useful in the UI test suites. Imagine you have a UI test suite and uh, there's some, I don't know, animation networking code that you are not too sure about. You can run it through the um, repeat until failure configuration and if it passes, so if it does all its iteration and it never fails, uh, then you're good because your tests are going to be green. Otherwise, it at some point it fails. Actually, is going to tell you. This is useful to discover flaky test. Then we have the retry on failure, which is the exact opposite. Uh, if a test fails, Xcode is going to try it again. And uh, this is useful if you have some flaky tests that uh, are inherently flaky or that you don't have the time yet uh, to 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 address, but it's still useful to have uh, the the feedback from the test when when it works. You can run it. You say, oh, okay, it failed, but I know because it's a, it's a flake, and so I'm gonna run it again. And finally, we have the up until maximum repetition. So this one is gonna repeat your test uh, three times. I'm um, gonna go back a sec. So you can notice under the none, there's that three grayed out. 
So that's the maximum test repetitions parameter. And uh, it's great because you can't edit it, or at least I couldn't find a way to, to modify it, which is a bit disappointing because three runs, they, I don't know, I don't feel they're statistically relevant. So sometimes I've had flaky tests that I would run 20 times and they were all green and then I merged the PR and as soon as I merged it, the first run on develop, uh, it, it failed. So I hope in the future to be able to beef that number up. But basically this one just runs it the number of times that you tell it and um, it even tells you the percentage of past. And um, this is useful to diagnose the stability of your code. So say you think you fixed a, a flaky test, you you know you hammer it with this test repetition here. And uh, if they all, if all of the tests pass, you can be a bit more confident that you fixed the flake. Finally, add tear down block. Um, I don't have anything snarky to say about this API. is 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 pretty nice. So let's just let me just show it to you. So this is a um, is a function that you can call from from your XC test case um, sub, subclass, and uh, it takes a closure, and it re registers this closure in a stack, last in first out of um, yeah tear down blocks that uh, the test is going to execute, or the test runner is going to execute once the test finishes, and as you can see in the in the console, unlike the instance level tier down that runs after each of the tests that um, add tier down block that uh, enter the stack from test example two only runs in text example two. And uh, I defined it before the print statement to show that it runs after the print statement because it is a, a tear down block. Um, this, is, this is it for testing. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you why I care so much about testing. Uh, I have been spending the past year more or less uh, writing a book on test-driven development in Swift. Uh, as far as I know, it's the only book so far that uh, has examples with Swift UI and Combine. Uh, you can find more about it on tddinswift.com. If um, I can manage to prepare a talk, I'll give a talk about uh, uh, TDD and uh, some stuff from the book uh, next month um yeah it's going to be available at, it should be available at the end of the month and um yeah buzz gave away my surprise but uh, yeah i had one more thing and that is uh, vim key bindings i am probably the only person right now that is excited about this so i don't know if if nobody cares uh just break the break my presentation and I'm very excited of this. Um, the joke is uh, so nobody knows how to quit Vim, and this way nobody's going to know how to quit Xcode, which goes back to Apple's plan for you never to leave Xcode. But yeah, Vim key bindings. Uh, Vim is awesome. I love Vim. Um, the key bindings introduce the concept of modal editing into Xcode. Uh, so modal editing is the, 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 the keystrokes, the, the keys in your, in your keyboard, you don't only use them to write words, but you can use them to manipulate the text through a certain Vim command language that is composed of a verb for what you want to do, a movement, uh, and a subject. And uh, I'll get into that uh, in, in a second. Then you have insert mode, which is just when you are actually writing, and visual mode, which is when you are selecting text. The support is limited for now. I, I've been trying it out and a lot of the stuff that is muscle memory for a Vim user isn't there, so it's a bit awkward. Uh, but um, I feel um, courageous tonight. And so demo time. Let me let me try to convince you that, that uh, Vim is awesome and that uh, you should enable that mode in your Xcode. So what I'm going to do is going to stop this screen share and uh, share my entire screen so you can see uh, yeah, the Xcode window and uh, keyboard visualizer. OK. Yeah, I went back to the entire screen. Here we are. OK. So. The first question is, how do you enable it? So you go to the to the settings screen, text editing, editing, 
and then enable Beam key bindings. And now you have this beautiful um, information bar at the bottom that gives you some hints on of what to do we, uh, in, um, right now we are in normal mode, the mode in which you insert all your commands. Um, okay, is this a bit better? Is is the window better this way? To the right, sorry, Gio. Okay, I really need to do it to the right. All there right, we go. sorry. Perfect, thank cool. you. Okay, let me just get rid of this stuff. All right, so I need to move my keyboard here okay so yeah you have this um, bar here that gives you some hints of stuff that you can do with the Vim key bindings to, to, to explore which is fun um, so let me show you around first of all when you your, your arrows work so nothing is much different from what you do if you find that you don't know what to do just press I to get into insert mode and you can start writing code as usual. Let's do the interesting things. You can go up and down the, the source code with J and K and left and right with H and uh, L. These are better than the arrows because they are all on your four fingers that are in the home row of a, of a QWERTY keyboard. I said Vim as this verb, motion, uh, subject, so if I wanted to go down to line five, I could do four J and I jump down there. I go down four lines. I want to go up two lines, two K and so on. Now Vim itself has a mode in which uh, it's going to show zero in the line where you are, then one in the lines on top and beneath and, and, and two in the one beneath and above and, and so on, which makes it easier to to jump around. Otherwise, you need to do the math in your head and I can't do it. Then um, there's more advanced way to move. For example, if you do E, you're going to go at the end of a word. With B, you're going to go back at the beginning. And with W, you're going to move between words. And notice how beautiful it is that they're quite mnemonic, all the all the commands. So B for beginning, E for end, and so on. If you use the uh, uppercase version, so, so Shift E, Shift B, you're gonna go at the end of a block of words. So see here with B and E, I just go between the start and the end of knife, but with the uppercase version, I go until I find a space. And this is very handy to, to move quickly. Um, let me show you visual mode now. So if you jump at the start of the line, you can jump at the start of the line with um, shift six or at the end with shift four for the dollar sign. So back to the start of the line, you can hit B to enter visual mode and then just selecting code and you can combine it with all the different motion to select code really fast. You can press D to, to delete. And the, the code that you delete goes in your in your clipboard. I'm not sure if it is the system clipboard or just like the one for, for Xcode, but anyway, you can then whoop. I'm back. <laughs> um, am I can you see me? Yeah, I can see myself in Rob's screen. Um, yeah, just reshare your screen. Uh, I just reshare the screen. Good one. Ah, uh, because that was a frozen frame. Ah, uh, that is my screen. Anyway, reshare the screen. Um, isn't it fun that uh, instead of crashing Xcode, I somehow crashed uh, uh, my sl Skype call. That that's interesting. That's a new that's a new one in my embarrassing story of. of 
live coding experiences. So let's move. Let's move on. Uh, so like, yeah, you delete it and it goes in the clipboard. So you can paste it somewhere else. And to paste it, maybe you guess it, you can use P. And um, then you can undo and redo really easily with U and Control R. You can jump to the top and the bottom of the of the text with GG for the top and uh, big G for the bottom. And this this is cool too. So um, say I go up to I go up a few lines and I say, hey, I want to delete this all, this entire enum. I can it is uh, four lines, so I can do D three J, and it's gone. I can put it back with with you. Undo, you for undo. Now to search, you can hit the the slash and write uh, what you want to search. For example, case, and then with N, you're gonna go to the next uh, result and shift N to to the previous one. This is very handy to to navigate your search results quickly. Next start that I want to show you is all right. So I don't know how useful it is. But this is this is neat for me. You can join lines very quickly, and when I say join, I mean this. And then you can, uh, again, you can combine stuff that you do, commands and motions that you do in in, in Vim. So I want to delete everything inside these uh, curly braces. So I can do D, D, E, and the curly braces. Oh man, I. <laughs> this is the. You know, when someone when someone looks at you typing, you forget how to type. So delete inside the curly braces. There you go, and and it's gone, um, which uh, which is very fast if you don't stumble your way through the keys and get all upset because you are live streaming. Uh, the final thing I want to show you is something cool. So here we are in Australia, and apparently it's okay to put pineapple on pizza. Um, my friends in Italy would disagree, but um, we can quickly toggle this this false by saying change inside entire word and write true. And um, that's it for my for my demo time. I'm gonna jump back to the slides because I have one last thing to tell you. Let's see if I can crush it again or can do it properly. Just looking for keynotes, sorry. Present. On my way, okay. Yeah, demo time is over. Uh, it, it went kind of well. So, Xcode and Veeam is awesome. I hope I did a decent job at convincing you. There's so much more to, to learn about it. And uh, um, hopefully as the betas keep rolling, issues are going to be fixed and functionalities are going to be added. And I'm so excited about it that I thought I'd put together a course. So um, if you go to mokakunin.com slash Xcode-heart-beam, Xcode-heart-beam, uh, you can sign up to to learn more about it. And uh, this is it for me. Thank you, uh, Geo. I work at Automatic. We're hiring, so get in touch if you want to know more. You can find me on Twitter at MochaGeo. I blog at mochacoding.com, and you can find more about me at geo.codes. Thank you. like last week and I've read about six pages. I feel really bad about that, but I will get around to it. Um, and I'm sure everyone will buy the book when it comes out uh, next month or at the end of the month. Uh, but that was a great talk. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, next up, we are going to have Rob talking about, I'm, I'm not even going to try and say the title of this slide. Uh, I'll let Rob try and pronounce that one for you. Over you, Rob.
Okay, we click the button and hopefully everything just works. Hooray! Seems to be working. Cool. Thanks, Baz. Um, cool, yeah, so I'm Rob. You've probably seen me around. Um, this is kind of a follow-up mixed with WWDC on a presentation I gave a couple of months ago about building custom publishers. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But for the time being, let's see if I can actually make this go or whether my run of good luck with tech has failed, is failing again. Um, cool. It is working, hooray. Um, so, Async A8 came out and everybody cheered because it's been coming with, um, if you've been watching the Swift evolution process that's been going on for about four or five months now, um, and Async A8 has been available in the um, nightlies for a long time, but I'm very lazy and couldn't be bothered actually running any of those up. So Tuesday was the first day I got to play with Async A8, something that I've been looking at for a long time. Um, but the problem was, is the, um, we're very heavily invested in Combine, in the code base that I spend my days working on now. Um, so the first thing I wanted to know is, especially given the, the radio silence from the Swift Evolution team, how is Combine and Swift uh, Async Await going to work together? And the answer is, we don't know. If you try and search for Combine presentations in this year's WWDC, you'll get a big fat zero. So they're still continuing with the radio silence, especially from Apple this time. Um, and that is very disconcerting, especially for the future of Combine, if you've invested in it as much as we have. But all is not lost. There are actually ways to do this. Um, and I will give a very quick disclaimer before I go any further than this. Um, all the code that I'm about to show is up on GitHub. Um, you're more than welcome to play around with it. It probably will set your computer on fire, so no warranties are offered. Um, I guarantee you I've done something wrong there because this is very uh, complicated stuff that I'm still struggling to get my head around. But yeah, we'll see how we go. Um, so the three things I want to talk about quickly. One is creating a publisher from an async function. So that is, so you've got um, an async function that you can then put inside a publisher. The publisher will admit when the function returns or it will fail with an error. Uh, the second one is mixing async functions into your publisher chain, so being able to, to map through an async function. Um, and the third one is awaiting the results of a publisher. So having a normal await statement work with your with a publisher. All three are possible. Um, they get a bit more complicated as we go down the tree, but I'm going to assume that if you're watching this, that you have seen the async await and structured concurrency talks in um, in WWDC this year. If not, and you're watching this on delay, pause now and go watch those first, and then come back to this. If you're watching live, then you'll just have to play along with me, but I will point out which talks are good to go and see which bits of the what I'm talking about. Um, so let's dive in. So just a couple of, a little bit of background there. So we had to have two little async helper functions here, because um, finding async functions are actually kind of difficult in the, in, like me, finding a meaningful example for this is very hard when it's, you can't just grep the documentation for async because that just returns a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so anyway, two really simple async functions. One returns a string, one will throw an error, so on and so forth. Um, now, future seemed like a really good candidate for this um, because if you're familiar with combined future, um, it will emit or fail once. So it emits one value or it fails. And this is pretty much exactly what an async function does. And probably the most likely candidate for people moving their, um, their combined code over to async await later on. Uh, so this was the goal that I started with. Basically what I was trying to build was a future that takes a asynchronous closure and then emits the result. Seems like it should be, should, shouldn't be too difficult. Um, and it turns out it actually wasn't. Uh, so this is literally all we needed to do for that. Um, we define our the async throws closure that we accept into as the input parameter. Um, we do our normal future in it. So our normal future in it where we get the promise in. Um, and then we use this little uh, convenience function here called async. Um, now in the next beta or the beta after, this will change into 
task, the task initializer, but for now it's async. Um, this tells uh, the to tell Swift that you want to run whatever's in this block of code asynchronously. And you can't actually see my mouse, so that's not helpful me highlighting things. Um, it tells you what's in that block of async code to run it uh, in an asynchronous concept, context, um, even if you're not in an asynchronous context. Um, so inside the asynchronous context, then we can call, uh, we can await for the results of other functions. Um, and all we do then is call our closure using try await. If that succeeds, the promise will be passed to the future, the future will emit. Um, if it fails, we, we pass through that error. Um, and that actually works. It works pretty well. Um, but if you've seen my talk from a few weeks or a few months ago, um, what happens if the subscriber to the, the future cancels? Or what about back pressure? Um, what about call publishing? Because that's going to run everything immediately. So we can actually um, take a look at how async it works, how async function works. Um, it's just a function that creates an unstructured task um, and returns a handle to that task with our task.handle there. Um, and if you have a look at the, the definition of the task handle, it actually has a, a cancel function on it. It has a few more other ones as well, but given that we can um, cancel that using a task, cancel, task handle, yeah, task handle, now I think I'm saying task candle. Um, all we need to do is somehow capture the result of that async back here, and um, and we're good. We can then pass the cancellation cancellation up if we need to. Um, unfortunately, because we're inside a, a single function and we can't just add stuff to future, we have to go a little bit further. Now I gave a talk. This is part of that talk that I gave in custom publishers and creating a custom publisher. I'm going to skip out all of the gory details on how to do this. Um, go back and see that other talk from April, I think it was. Um, all the source codes on GitHub, you'll get a link to that at the end. So really, all we, all we do here is we create a publisher. I've called it task publisher, because um, that's what it is, which accepts the closure as its input. Um, and then to actually deal with the demand from our sub subscription, when our subscriber requests demand, um, we save the result, that handle, that we get back by calling detach. Now detach is exactly the same as async, um, except where async, the async function, or a partial async task, or a unstructured task, or whatever it is, by default it will inherit its parent's closure. So if you're running on the main actor, for example, the, the task that you run inside async will also be on the main thread with the same level of priority. Detach lets you take that, throw it out the window, and start a brand new context um, with an optional priority if you want to add your own priority. Um, yeah, so we, we run that async closure that we've been passed in, and then it all it does is uh, asynchronously runs that closure, returns the output. Um, and then we've got the, the value down the bottom there to actually, when we get the value back from our closure, um, send it to our subscriber, and then we close off the, the publisher, so it behaves the same way as future. Once it emits, it, it completes. And the other part of that um, subscription method is the cancel function. So when our subscriber calls cancel, we just pass the cancel straight up to our um, task handlers cancel. So the task itself gets canceled. And that works well. Um, I wrapped it in a nice little with publisher function. Um, so you can now just call with publisher with your asynchronous uh, function closure and then treat it like a normal publisher after that. So this is this the reason I went with with publisher, and there's also a with throwing publisher, is because Apple has seen that that's the standard. They're currently with with task group and with throwing task group, with continuation, uh, with checked continuation, with throwing checked continuation, a whole bunch of these with functions. So with publisher sounds good. All right, so mixing it up. Um, again, Examples are hard, so this is a contrived one. Let's say we were to try and implement the asynchronous um, URL session. That should be data task publisher, not data task, but that's okay. Um, let's just pretend that says URL session dot shared dot data task publisher, um, and that it returns the publisher version of this, and then it has the um, 
we can provide a asynchronous map that lets us run the async closure in the in an asynchronous context um, and emits the result, and then we do something with the result. Um, and that's actually really easy because oh wow, Kino, what have you done? Okay, the 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 stream is correct, but the keynote window is not. There we go. Um, that's really easy because we've already got that task publisher. We can just treat it like a flat map. Uh, we can take the the value that we get in to the the flat map closure, um, and then we just return our task publisher, um, and we're done. Like that's that's literally all there is to that. It's very straightforward. Now another contrived example, and again it should say data task publisher instead of data task. Um, someone did not vet these slides that I put together 10 minutes before we were supposed to be going live. Um, but let's say you wanted to implement exactly how, um, or very similar to how um, URL, se URL session does its synchronous, sorry, its asynchronous um, data task loading. Um, so let's say we call our data task publisher, um, we then map it to get the data out of it, we call first because we want a single result and then we want it to close. Um, and then we have a little function here called get, which just tells us that we can, it takes that, um, the combine context and the, the, yeah, your combine publisher and awaits the result of that publisher. Um, so for this example, um, Apple provides support for continuations. Now continuations are the way that you take an asynchronous code, you pause your asynchronous code, or you suspend the asynchronous code and tell it to pick up again in a moment. Sorry, this is the with checked continuation one that Apple provides. Um, and it basically is just a block that provides, passes in a continuation um, struct, and then you call resume on that with the result of whatever it is you're doing. And then the asynchronous function picks up and runs off with that. Um, check the um, the exploring. I think it's exploring structured concurrency talk that's currently up on on the developer app. Um, they go into a lot more detail on how, how exactly this works. Um, the checked continuation one is really good because it actually it does the whole checks all of your code paths to make sure that you resume on all of the possible code paths. Um, if you fail to resume on any of these code paths, your code will just hang. And I spent an hour debugging Xcode trying to figure out why the simulator was doing basically nothing. Um, but it turns out it was actually just waiting for the publisher to emit, and it wasn't. So this then is our, um, we create a custom subscriber for this one, which I meant we went through how to do in the other talk. Um, it's just, again, a simple function where we get our custom subscriber and it subscribes to the publisher that you pass in. Um, and then we use a task cancellation handler, which is also very helpful. Um, it allows us, if the task is then cancelled, to then cancel the upstream publisher. Um, so we're being nice citizens that way. Um, and then we use the with unsafe throwing continuation because Apple guards against you um, passing the can continuation into an escaped closure because then that is apparently they can't um, check it for safety anymore. Um, so guarantees when you put in the with unsafe bit that you're going to set something on fire. But basically all we do then is the subscriber has a, a little function where it takes a block um, and they, um, the block expects a, um, a result to come back in from your, from the publisher itself. So the publisher emits a, a result, which is the output value or a failure. Um, and then we just resume the continuation with that. So in, in better words, when we get into the, the get function, our asynchronous get function, we suspend the, the operation until the publisher has emitted a result, um, and then we continue with that with that result. Apple slides are way better at explaining how all of the pieces there work. Go check out what they've got. And that's it. That's all I've got. Um, if you want to go and check out the source code for all of this, it's at github.com slash unsigned app slash combine asynchually. Um, and yeah, I'll post the link for that in the in the the Slack channel as well. Um, it has everything you've just seen, plus it's fully tested or mostly tested. Do you will be happy to know that? 
Um, it's almost impossible to test task cancellation, but yeah, I've gone as far as I can in the short time that we've had so far. We'll see if we can improve that in the future. Hopefully someone smarter than me can look at that and go, hey, yeah, you've got, you know, this race condition and that race condition and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, thanks very much. Back to you, Baz. Once again, I'm completely amazed that you managed to get that together in the short period of time that you've known about this stuff. Uh, when I've managed to watch about three videos, uh, that's about it. So that's our talks for tonight. Uh, once again, a big thank you to our sponsors, HBT Apps, Latitude, REA Group, and Cognizant. Uh, next event will be the drinks night on Tuesday, 29th of June. But if you want to have virtual drinks in Zoom, we'll be doing that uh, in a couple of minutes. There will be a link in the Slack. Uh, and it'd be nice to see everyone there, chat some more about what's going on this week. Uh, thanks for joining us. And hopefully we can see you all in person next month. Good night.